The title of my message this morning is Heaven's View of Our Failures. Now I'm talking about, I'm talking to the real believer. I'm talking to the genuine Christian. I'm, I'm speaking to the one who in your heart, you say, I do. I have received Christ as my Savior. I've trusted him for my forgiveness. And I want to walk with God. I, I really do. But I struggle. I fail. I falter. How does God see me? And I feel so condemned, but is God condemning me? Does, does heaven agree with the devil's assessment of my life? And sad to say, quite often my own heart condemns me. Ephesians chapter 6, if you go there in your Bible and hold it there, and Numbers chapter 22 in the Old Testament, we're going to take a look at heaven's view. I promise you we're going to sing again after this. There's a joy here today because... The Lord knew what he was going to speak to your heart. And it's his delight to rejoice over us. So, Father, I thank you with all of my heart today for truth. Truth, Lord, that sets us free. The entrance of which your Bible tells us, your word tells us, gives light, gives life, gives direction, gives hope. Breathes, Lord, into those places where we have sometimes lived in repeated failure. I thank you, God, for this incredible truth for the true and genuine believer in Christ this morning. God Almighty, give me the anointing to be able to speak this and let these words be engraved in our hearts and in our minds for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 6, heaven's view of our failures beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That means that the schemes, the arguments, the, the contrary things to truth that not only Satan himself, but every devil of hell that's under his authority who has the same spirit, will try to, to speak into your heart. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. This is an evil day. This is a day where I think many of God's people are uh, waking up to the fact that there is a spiritual battle going on for planet Earth right now. For the hearts and the minds of men, women, and children. And there's even a more fierce battle being waged against the church of Jesus Christ. It's not a battle that's being fought in the courts. There, there are certain things that are happening that we could point to, but this battle is much deeper than, than that, that we see with our natural eye. This is something going on in heavenly places. This is a battle above our heads, may I put it that way, that we don't always see or understand, but we feel the effects of it. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. We're not, we're not fighting what we can see here on this earth. We're not fighting on, on a level of just humanity that's all around us, but there's something going on, and even more so in this day, that's above us. There's, there's a fight for, for the, the conscience even of the church is, is being fought against now. All hell is doing everything in its power to keep us in subjection to a feeling of mediocrity and to cause us to forget who we really are in Christ. Revelation 12 says, 10 describes Satan himself as the accuser of the brethren who accuses us day and night. He never stops accusing us, never stops magnifying our failures, never stops speaking about our faults. John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus described him as the father of lies. He is the, is the father of it, of, of all lies, and he tries to get the people of God to believe that his reasonings are right and they are true. Now, God gives no heed to his voice. We know that. The Lord doesn't listen to him. 
But unfortunately, we do quite often. Those whispers, those little condemnations, those, that magnification as it is of our faults and our failures and our struggles that causes so many of us to come into the house of God, not in victory. We're, now we, we sing songs and we experience moments of victory, but we're not living in victory because we go back out and the devil's right there to meet us on the corner saying, who do you think you are? And what makes you think your life is going to make any kind of a difference? Your, your wife, your husband, your kids know what you are. Your coworkers know what you are. And look at how you fail. You falter. You, you feel bad. Why don't you just keep your mouth shut from now on and be content just to be called by the name of God. And don't try to make a difference in the world because God feels the same way about you that you do. That's what the devil tries to plant in even your own heart. You know, that's why the scripture says, if my own heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. And he has made some promises to me that he cannot forsake. Ephesians 6 tells us that Satan and his forces approach us with wiles, which means deceptive suggested, suggestions, which really mean that try to convince us that these thoughts and these voices are coming from a heavenly vantage point implying that God sees our failure exactly as they do and as sometimes we feel that he does and trying to bring us into an agreement that our lives are of no value to the kingdom of God. We'll never amount to anything. We'll never accomplish anything. The, 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 the purposes of God will never be made known to us. We, we will always be marginalized and small and defeated and hanging our heads and living in the dust as it is this is what the devil will do everything in his power to try to convince you that you are. Now in Numbers chapter 22, we have a classic, we have an actual textbook case of what spiritual warfare in heavenly places looks like. Now, I want to begin at, in chapter 22 at verse 1 to verse 6. It says, Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab, on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now they've had their victory, of course, and they're on their journey. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw, that, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. In other words, this king, this evil king, he knew the history of these people. The devil knows the history of the church. Do you know that? He's been around when nations have bent their knee to God. He's been around when Esther approached the throne of the king and, and threw his decree of death to the wind. He's been around when Gideon heard from God and in his poverty stood up and set his camp of 100 on three different mountains and overcame 135,000 warriors that he was sending in to devour the nation of Israel. The devil knows he's been around longer than you and I. And this, this evil king says he understands the history of the people of God. And Moab this is where he dwelt, was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. That's why the apostle James says the devils believe and tremble. There's a fear in the host of evil because they know something about you and I that oftentimes we don't. And they live their whole day with the accuser of the brethren trying to get us into a place where their cursings towards us take away our strength and causing us to forget who we are, why we are left on the earth and the incredible power that is resident within us because they know the Spirit of God has taken up his abode inside our physical bodies. That's why the devils tremble. They tremble because they know that maybe somebody somewhere in some generation in some city is going to figure that out. I have the living God inside this body. And where he calls me to go, I will go. And what he gives me to do shall be done. And there's no power of hell that can stand against it. Oh, yes, they were there. They heard the commission of Christ when he said, go, heal the sick, cast out devils. They understand the power the church has. Sometimes we forget. 
And verse 4 says, So Moab said to the elders of Midian, I want you to picture this as demonic powers now. This company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at this time. And he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river, in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. I mean, look, a people have come out of bondage. A people have been saved from their oppressors. A people have been brought out by the power of God. Look, they cover the face of the earth and are sitting next to me. Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he who you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. This is spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, we're going to see in this story that this false prophet, a spiritist called Balaam, whom this evil king believed had power of speech to curse the people of God. He was going to bring him into the place where the people of God were, and from three vantage points up on a high mountaintops, he was going to show him the people of God and ask him to curse the people of God from there. This is a, an absolute type of spiritual warfare. Now, the people of God of that time don't know this is going on. They don't, all of this is happening above their heads. There's a, a war, in a sense, going on. God is actually going to fight for them. God is going to appear to this spiritist called Balaam. He's going to override the evil power that dominates this man, and he's going to get a hold of him and say to him, you only speak what I tell you. <laughs> Praise be to God. It's, it's a phenomenal story when you read it, how God intervenes and says, I'm not going to let you curse my people. I have blessed them, and they cannot be cursed. I am with them. They cannot be overcome. Now, these high places, they worship a god called Baal Peor. And you talk about wickedness in high places. The form of worship that they gave to this, this idol called Baal Peor was to drop their pants, expose their rear end to the face of this god, and defecate in its presence. And then following that, they would go off and in nudity, and they would engage in nudity and drunkenness, and this was their form of worship. This is what's going on on these mountaintops. This is who these people are. This is how wicked they have become. Don't ever underestimate how wicked humanity can become when they've forsaken the worship of the true God. Now they, even in their wickedness, are aware of how powerful the people of God are. I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. We're, we're living at a time when drunkenness and immorality and lies and incivility and division and violence seems to be dominating uh, our society. It looks like darkness is winning the day, but they are still aware. Every power and principality of hell is aware and afraid of you as the people of God. The question now is, are we aware of who we are? Were they aware of how God viewed them? Or were they so troubled by their own weakness that they had forgotten who they were? It's an incredible thought. It's an incredible thought that were they so in agreement with this cursing that's coming from this evil place? It's coming from a place of spiritual wickedness in high places. It, it's coming from a place of those who feel that they have the power through their speech to curse the people of God and to cause them to come into agreement with their assessment of them. That's why we fight in our minds so hard in this generation. That's why these sudden random thoughts come into your mind and into your heart just throughout the day, accusing you of failure, accusing you of uh, of. of falling so short of what God would have you, reminding you of every wrong word, every wrong deed, every wrong thought, every wrong thing, to, to beat you down and beat you down and to come under the curse that the devil himself is under. He's eternally cursed. He wants you just to share it for a little, a little while. And so let's look at the history of these people just a little bit. I'm going to go through this real fast with you. You can, and I'll, I'll mention the chapters. You can look at it yourself. 
So how victorious were these people in the natural? Chapter 11, now before this confrontation takes place, you have to get the scene, you have to see. Chapter 11, verse one, the people complained, it displeased the Lord, the Lord heard it, his anger was aroused, the fire of the Lord burned among them, it consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. They've been set free from Egypt, they're led out into a place where they're given this incredible promise and they're already complaining, don't we do that? I mean, man is born to complain as sparks fly upward. Doesn't the scripture say that? It's so easy to complain in the morning, so hard to praise God sometimes, isn't it? So hard to focus our thoughts on what is, what is true, as Paul said, what is right, what is lovely, what is good. And, you know, we complain, and when we complain, we get overwhelmed. And when we get overwhelmed, we lose spiritual vision. And when we lose spiritual vision, we start to agree with the devil. Verses 4 to 10 of the same chapter, the, the mixed multitude among them. In other words, there's, there's certain people on this journey are not fully yet given to their purpose on the earth, and they start remembering. Now, they forgot about the bricks and the taskmasters and making straw. They forgot about their children being thrown in the river. And now all of a sudden they're saying, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Now our whole being is dried up and there's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Like manna, food from heaven. It's like the type of a Christian says, oh, it was so good when I used to go to the clubs on Saturday night. I, I remember the cocktails. I remember the, the dances I used to have. I remember the good times I used to have. And now I just sit here with the word of God. That's all I've got is the word of God. All I can do is stay home Saturday night and read my Bible. I'm just so tired of this. Oh, it was so good back then. How foolish they were. And Moses heard the people, it says, weeping throughout their families, everyone in the door of his tent. They were, you can imagine, they've just come out of 400 years of captivity and they're weeping in their tents for onions. <laughs> and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Chapter 12 and verse 1, it says now, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. So here we are now further into the journey, and there's now a rebellion at the, at the top echelons of the leadership. Uh, Aaron and Miriam are simply jealous that Moses is the leader, and they want to lead too as well. So they find a reason to accuse him, and they start accusing him. That's chapter 12 and verse 1. Just when you think it couldn't get worse, they come to the very shores of the place of promise that God has set them free and he's bringing them into this place. They send out 12 spies into this promised land and they, they go in, they examine it and 10 of the 12 come back and say, it's, we can't do it. It's too hard. It's everything that God says it is, but it's too hard. The, the mountains are too high. The, the, the giants are too big. What voice do you think they were listening to when they went into that place? And so the people wept all night. The scripture says they lost heart. They, uh, and it, it so grieved the heart of God that he, he had to tell the people, you're, you're going to live in the wilderness now. You're going to live there for a whole generation because I wanted to take you in and you just didn't believe that I could. And it's, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost your children. You're going to live in this, this constant procession of dust and funerals until another generation arises that is willing to go in. In chapter 14, knowing their predicament, they decide to go into battle without the counsel of God. God's telling them, don't do this. But instead of listening to the voice of the Spirit, they're now listening to their own uh, strategists. And they decide now to go in in the natural and try to fight this battle with, with natural resources. And of course, they're defeated. And it's terrible when you try as a church age to go into this battle without the presence or the leading of the Lord. In chapter 16, when you think it can't get any worse, there's a major rebellion now. Some people have succeeded in getting 250 men of renown, leaders who were famous among the people. And they take out their censers, which is a type of prayer, and they stand before the tabernacle and they say to Moses, we're holy just like you are. We hear from God just as you do. You take too much upon yourself. You uh, declare that God speaks to you and you're our leader, but we, we believe we hear from God just like you do. You, and, they, and they go on, they say, is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? 
I, I can just imagine Moses, uh, just a minute now, just a minute. Wasn't that place that you're describing as a land of milk and honey, Egypt? Weren't they beating you every day? Allowing you to sleep four hours a night, sending you out before sunrise to gather straw, making you make bricks and beating you if you didn't make enough bricks. And weren't they taking your firstborn sons and throwing them into the river? That's the land of milk and honey. And they said, is it a small thing you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. So they're declaring and accusing Moses, you deceived us. They, they won't take blame for what they have done. They won't deal accurately with history, but they blame Moses for their predicament. Of course, the end result is that the fire of God comes out of the tabernacle and burns the whole of the 250 to a crisp. The ground opens up and the leaders who incited this rebellion are swallowed by the earth. Then the people, it says in chapter 16, verse 41, all the congregation the next day, the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. I mean, as if they opened the ground, as if they were the ones who instigated the fire to come out of the tabernacle. Now they're blaming Moses and Aaron of unrighteous judgment. And God, at this point, sends a plague and 14,700 people die. Because it, there was a point where the Lord said, this is enough of this. I have to show my people that this is, this is not right. They cannot continue on this journey this way. In Chapter 20, the people complain again, unwilling to take responsibility for their own actions. They say, you brought us out here to starve. We have no water for our cattle. And finally, Moses has had enough. And Moses loses his temper. You know, that temper that he never fully dealt with when he was young that caused him to kill an Egyptian with a sword. Now he takes that temper, that temper gets a hold of him and he hits that rock and he calls the people rebels. And the Lord says to Moses, you have dishonored me. And because you have dishonored me before the people, you are not going in to the promised land. And he says to Moses, don't speak to me again about this. It's an amazing thing. Like it's, Moses didn't lose heaven. He got to go to heaven, but he didn't get to go into where he, the fullness of his life could have led him on the earth. Now, this is the people, all right, coming around the corner. These are the people coming into the land of Moab. These are the people that Balak is afraid of. These people have lost sight of who they are. They, they would be so aware of their failure. They've got a failed leader now. His head has to be down. I'm not going into the promised land. The people have died. They have rebelled. They've, I didn't even talk about the calf that they built. I mean, all of the stuff that they have done in all these chapters preceding to this moment, now Balak says to Balaam, let's go to three vantage points on these mountains and let's curse, the, you curse the people of God. You take away their final shred of strength. And so now in Numbers chapter 23, in verse 7, you, you should read this when you get home because you're going to love this in this context when you read all of this particular uh, book of the Old Testament. Verse 3 says, <clears throat> So Balaam said to Balak, This is the first opportunity now to curse the people of God. Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. That's where the devil lives, by the way, in an empty, barren, desolate place. The Lord comes to Balaam and tells him, as I told you earlier, you will only, and he does it more than once, you will only speak what I give you. Now, from this verse, from this very first place, it said, verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 7, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. Verse 8, here's what he says. How shall I curse him? God is not cursed. How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? From the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? 
or number one fourth of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Praise be to God. Now this is God now speaking. This is God has taken over. God has not allowed the devil to condemn the people of God. God has said, this is how I see these people. And you're going to say what I say. You're going to see what I see. You're going to speak what I speak. Coming around the corners, a lot of failures. Coming around the corners, the people have, they've not done everything, almost anything right. But I'll tell you one thing about these people. Whenever a line was drawn in the sand and the words were spoken, who is on the Lord's side? These are the people that stepped over the line and just kept going. These are the people who just get out of their seat and keep going to the altar in spite of their failure. I don't feel good about myself, but I am on the Lord's side. And the Lord, I believe, is on my side. These are the people that just kept moving forward. And God speaks through this prophet and says, I see a people separated unto God, not reckoned among the nations. I see a people, a unique people, a peculiar people called to show forth the light of God in the midst of darkness. I see a people, he says, given to an unstoppable increase. They were going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. They're going to grow in number and nobody can stop it. I see a people destined to be victorious no matter what anybody says. Then in verse 13, it says, well, verse 11, Balak says to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies and look, you've blessed them bountifully. And so he answered and said, that's 23, 12, must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? Then Balak said to him, please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall see only the outer part of them. You shall not see them all and curse them for me from there. In other words, okay, you're looking at the big picture. Let's, let's just look at like one little piece. Let's go to a place where, okay, I, I get the fact that that uh, Keyshawn and John and Joan and Jane and Jim are all saved. I, I get that. I get that. They're the people of God. They're destined. But, but let's just look at this failure. Let's, let's look at this one part of their life. Let's look at this area of weakness. Let's, let's look at this thing that they are struggling with all the time. And, and seemingly, even with a good heart, they're not fully getting the victory yet. Let, let's look at it from there. And, and maybe it'll be easier to curse them from there. Okay, he says. So he goes up. Again, they offer a burnt offering to their, uh, their idolatrous worship. And then it says in verse 18, he took up this oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zippor. Verse 19 of chapter 23, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do? Or has he spoken and he will not make it good? You remember Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you. You are sealed in my Father's hand and nobody can take you out of the hand of my Father. There's no mountain, there's no valley, there's no wall, there's no power, there's no principality, there's no angel in heaven. There's nothing that can take you away from the love of God. Behold, he says, verse 20, I have received a command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. How astounding that must have been. These people are just a whole pack of failures. A failed leader, a failed people. They've struggled, they've, they've, but they're still going forward. And how awesome it must have been for this man to say, God does not see iniquity in them. God does not see wickedness in them. The Lord, his God is with him and the shout of a king is among them. Well, they didn't have a king. So what is the shout and why is the king shouting? The only shout I can think of is going to be a few years down the road when the Son of God 
with a voice so loud that a centurion said, this surely is the son of God, said it is finished. It's finished. The reign of hell is over. The power of the wicked one is destroyed. I have taken captivity captive and I have given gifts unto men. I have declared you righteous. I see no iniquity, but I hear the shout of a king. Oh God, oh God, help us to get this in our heart. God brings them out of Egypt. He has trance like a wild ox. God will not help his people live in captivity. They will not be dominated by fallen men, no matter how powerful fallen men think they are. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It must now be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, what God has done. There's nobody can curse you. There's no voice of hell that can condemn you. There's no power of evil that could triumph over you. And may it be said in your life and mine, oh, look what God has done. Look what God has done. Look, he says in verse 24, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down till it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. This people are going to go from strength to strength. No power of hell is going to stop them. And they will rise with the strength of a lion inside of them. And they will experience the victory. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Then Balak said to Balaam, please come. I will take you to another place. Verse 27. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. I hear the pleading now in the devil's voice. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. Ah, oh, look what's before them. It just seems like they're going to amount to nothing, doesn't it? Like they're given this incredible promise of God, but look what lies before them, just a wasteland. How, how, can, how, can, they, how can they even believe that out of, out of their present condition, something beautiful can happen? So curse them. And, and get them to agree that there's nothing before them. Get them to agree that they're not going to change. They're not going to be strengthened. They're not going to know victory. Get them to agree with me. Curse them, Balaam. And then he comes in chapter 24, beginning of verse 4. He said, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, and I love this, who falls down with eyes wide open. In other words, he just falls down. You can picture him just flat on his back say, oh God, this is hard to believe. But he's looking at the wasteland before the people of God and he's saying, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like a loaves planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the water. He will pour water out from his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He will break their bones, pierce them through with his arrows. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him up. And here's the last words of Balaam. Blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. Oh, I see something God says ahead of you. Not a wasteland. And so don't agree with your enemy. I see a lovely dwelling place. I see a valley that stretches out. I see gardens by the riverside. I see plantings of the Lord. I see cedars with their strength drawing waters that only God can provide. I, I, see, I see increase on every side, even in many waters. I, I see a kingdom that's going to be exalted through the people of God. I see the Lord lifted up through your life, through you.
I see God lifted up. The devil tried to convince you that because of your past failure, there's only a wasteland ahead of you. Just squeak out an existence and just try to kind of crawl over the finish line into heaven. Don't ever think you're going to amount to anything. He tries to get you to agree that that's the way God sees you. God says, no, I don't see you that way at all. I see a kingdom that I have established inside of you rising up and rising through you. I see God bringing you, Balaam said, out of Egypt. I see the Lord delivering you, this last day church that we're part of, out of all captivity. I see God again, God again, calling, telling the devil himself, let my people go, that they may serve me. I see the strength of God. I see God consuming the nations, his enemies. I see all human resistance against him crumbling. I see the words that he sends causing men's knees to bend before him. I see a blessing on the people of God that cannot be taken away. There's no power of hell can take it from you. You are a blessed people by God himself left on the earth with a divine purpose. And it's time now, it's time to stop agreeing with the devil. It's time to start agreeing with God. This is who I am. Yes, I falter. Yes, I stumble. But my Bible tells me it doesn't matter how many times I fall, the Lord will pick me up and I will keep on going. Yes, I've made mistakes in the past, but my past does not determine my future. God determines my future. And my own heart may condemn me and the devil may condemn me and even people he uses may condemn me. They may tell me nothing lies before me, that I'm wasted and washed up and going to be no good for his kingdom, but that isn't true. That's not what God sees. I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. And I will go where God says I will go and I will become what God says I will become. Everything that he speaks over my life, I will be. He is God. There is no power of hell that can stop his plan in my life. There's nothing, nothing, nothing can triumph over the plan of God in my life. Nothing can take me away from the hand of my heavenly father. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Come what may. There is no power, there's no principality, there's no voice, there's nothing that can condemn me because Christ died for me, Christ has covered me, Christ declares me his own, Christ has a plan for my life. And just like a lion, just like a lion, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to conquer the darkness that stands in my way. I have a victory that God has given to me. Glory to God. Glory to God. What a day to be alive. What a day to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. What a day to rise up again in this generation. What a moment in history. Look what God has done. That's going to be our song at the end of this journey. Look what God has done. Look what God has made. Look what God has accomplished. Look where God has taken me. Look what God has given me. Look what God has done. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you today. One day, I don't know if we'll ever get to see Satan or not. I don't know. But if you do, I'm not talking about going to hell. I'm talking about just in those last moments before you go into heaven. I want you to look him in the eye and say, look what God has done. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Bless the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Look what God has done. Look what God has done. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory, glory to the name of God. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise the name of Jesus. Bless your holy name, God. Bless your holy name, Lord. We are a victorious people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you have done, for what you will do. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you. My God, my God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Like a lion that finishes thing, like a lion that rises up. It's been sleeping for a little while. It's, it's been laying down. But like a lion that suddenly rises up and says, I'm hungry. I hope you're hungry. I hope you're hungry for victory. Like a lion that rises up and says, I'm tired of this jackal barking at me. He has no idea who he's dealing with here. Like a lion that rises up. Let that be what's in your heart today. God Almighty. God Almighty. God Almighty, take me. If you're tired of your failure today and you just want to declare the victory of God, and say, look what the Lord has done. That's going to be my song. That's going to be my testimony. That's going to be, it's going to be my claim to fame when I get to the throne of God. Look what God, look what you did. Look what you did. Look what you did in me. If you're tired of agreeing with the devil and you want to agree with God, I'm going to ask you to slip out of your seat. Balcony, Main Sanctuary, North Jersey, step out. Step between the screens. Home fellowship, stand up in your living room, wherever you are. In the annex, you can step between the screens as well. And you're just tired. You're just tired of agreeing with the devil. You're tired of his condemning voice. You're tired of uh, all this gnawing feeling of failure and say, this is not how God sees me. And I'm going to become the person that God sees me to be. I'm serving notice on hell right now. I'm not living in this wilderness. I'm going into what God has for me. I want you to know something. No matter how you feel about yourself today, anybody here, the devil is afraid of you. Amen, amen. The powers and principalities over New York City are afraid of you because they know something that we have forgotten. The living God is with us. The living God has covered us. So we're going to rediscover it in this last age that we're now living in. We're going to find out again who we are and rise up as a lion. As the scripture says, as a lion, we're going to rise up and say, I've been beaten down long enough. I belong to the king. The king belongs to me. He's covered me and he's commissioned me to tear your kingdom down, devil. He's commissioned me. He's commissioned me. And so, Father, I pray for these men and women who have gathered here today and at the altar and those that are with us in their hearts online everywhere, Lord, and in the sanctuary. God, we are your people, and we choose this day to agree with you. We, we cast down uh, all these imaginings. You tell us that our weapons of our warfare are, are, are mighty through Christ to pull down these strongholds and these thoughts the devil has tried to plant in and destroy us with. And we agree with you, Lord, that we are your people. We agree that you have a divine plan. We agree that you've given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We agree, Lord. And God, so we just ask for the grace to go forward and not to lose sight, not to lose sight of who we are. And Father, thank you for it, God. Thank you, Lord, that each one of us can say, look at what the Lord has done. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.